Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I appreciate everyone uh, getting on time. Hopefully, you didn't have too many challenges uh, with the GoToMeeting format. I know one of our meetings earlier this week, when we were using the system, it was not working because so many companies are using uh, GoToMeeting and Zoom and some other uh, ways to communicate since we are going to be in a distancing environment for the short term. Um, the reason we're doing this is you know, I, I'd love to talk to all of you, and I've talked to many of you over the past few days and weeks, but we need to reach a bigger audience, and we wanted to share some information uh, with you today that may help do a better job of explaining what's going on. Uh, we know if you watch a lot of news right now, it can be extremely depressing. You have to remember the news and the media, they're designed to prey upon your emotions because fear sells three to four times as much as the truth. So um, I know it's been difficult. You guys are spending a lot of time with your families, and, and, and for some people that can cause some conflict. Other people, it's really been a blessing. Um, and really what we've had happen here is what's known as a black swan event. And a black swan event is something that is unique and unpredictable, and we're currently not having one black swan event but two. And uh, Mike will talk a bit about that in, in a minute. Um, some recent news today uh, from the White House press conference uh, was the uh, April 15th tax deadline has been moved to July 15th. Interest on student loans is going to be way for some time. I didn't catch how long, but that's good news for people who are having to pay interest on student loans. Um, there was a lot of rumors circulating last night that there was going to be a military National Guard shutdown starting uh, like Monday. And I talked to four different people in four different areas last night, and they all got the same message. Well, Mike Pompeo was asked this question in, in the White House briefing, and he said what happened was either Iran, North Korea, Russia, or China, or a combination of the above, flooded our social media with these false rumors, and they're just trying to create more stress and panic work where our country's under quite a bit of uh, duress. So it, it's disappointing. Um, there's some people out there who don't like Americans, and they'll try to take advantage of us anytime they can. Um, there is a, a really good site that I don't know if you guys have been to. It's called the Worldometer site, and it shows um, really good statistics about what's going on with the coronavirus. It has a number of cases, deaths, et cetera. One thing I want to point out to you here is in this active case, um, it looked like we hit a peak on February 17th, and the number of cases continued to drop. So as we got to the end of February, uh, Mike and I had made the decision to sell the put options in the portfolio because we thought, okay, looks like we're at the end of this, and the put options at that time had over 50% gains. Well, that, that was an early call, and we wish we'd have more of the put options, especially what's happened with the market now. Um, because of, of what's happened. And if you come down here and you can actually see uh, some more details um, from the various countries, obviously China is where this uh, disease originated. Um, Italy has just exploded. And, you know, the rest of Europe is, is not doing real well either. Now, one thing that's really important, uh, China, not China, but the United States and Italy, but we both had the, our first case of coronavirus diagnosed around January 21st. Uh, President Trump on the 31st made the decision to ban all flights from China. Italy did not do that. And we can see what's happening in Italy now. Um, I understand that 20% of the medical personnel in Italy are now infected with the COVID virus and they're looking for all kinds of help. Some good news in Italy is that in the northern part of the country where it originated, Lombardy region, it shows signs of starting to abate because the majority of people who get this are going to recover from it. And again, the media is going to focus on the deaths and the people who don't, but most people are going to recover from this. Um, The, uh, the other point I wanted to make where we're still looking at this slide, if you take a look at South Korea and uh, even China, and there's some question if these China numbers are accurate, 
we do know that a lot of the Chinese factories have reopened because we're seeing uh, pollution from our satellites. And China took a very draconian approach of a military shutdown. And because of, of that communist government regime, you listen to the government or it may cost you your life. We have kind of the opposite in this country, thankfully. South Korea is the model we're, we're, we're trying to do. And really what we're trying to do is to flatten the curve. And let me show you what that looks like. This. And this came out of The Economist. And if you have an outbreak without protective measures, you have a huge spike. Uh, people resolve, mostly recover, but it just taxes the health system to beyond, uh, beyond, beyond the capability. And what we want to do is the blue chart here, the blue graph, which is prolonging the number of cases that gives our healthcare care uh, professionals time to ramp up and be prepared. And the decision of shutting down uh, the flights from China bought us this in incredible amount of time so we can prepare. Guys, we're going to see a bigger spike in cases as more and more people get tested. And it's going to get worse before it gets better, but it will get better. Uh, the virus has shown some instance when the weather is warmer, it doesn't, um, it's not as contagious, it's not as passed on. So as we progress through spring and the summer, that will help us. And a lot of people want to know how contagious this virus is. And uh, this is an interesting chart. On the left-hand side of the chart shows the percentage of people who pass from the illness. The X uh, chart on the bottom shows the average number of people infected um, for each person. And the bird flu, uh, very high mortality rates, the MERS respiratory, the Ebola, very, very high uh, mortality rates, but the average number of people infected was, was not as high. Then you can look at here at the novel virus, chicken pox and measles, very high, uh, can, uh, very contagious, uh, but not really high death rates, very low. The COVID-19 virus, coronavirus transmissions is one and a half to three and a half people. Um, Statistics that I've seen in a couple of weeks ago showed it was about seven or eight people. So this has come down, which is good. The mortality rate is 0.7 outside of uh, China. Um, and that's kind of what we're looking at. And just the, the seasonal flu is about 1%. So it's obviously much more deadly than the flu. But, you know, 99% of us who get this are going to survive. So I think this is some good information that, that's not readily, um, readily uh, been shown. And the next thing I want to share with you is how have the markets responded when we've had viral uh, outbreaks in the past? And this is just going back, you know, 19 years. You know, here's the initial SARS outbreak. And I'll talk a little bit more about this because the SARS outbreak in 2002 and 3 was also a COVID virus. And there's a lot of similarities between COVID-19 and the SARS virus of 2002 and 2003. And the research that was done to try to prevent this from becoming a much worse pandemic um, was very helpful for the researchers today. So basically, they can dust off the records and books and take a look and say, okay, what worked, what didn't. So that's going to shorten the learning curve to get a vaccine created and also treatments, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, the Asian flu, and the, here's the swine flu. And the swine flu impacted more than 50 uh, million Americans. And um, I can't remember the exact number of people who died. I think it's 11, 12,000. Tab or Mike, if you know, you can speak up. But what's interesting is the stock market during the swine flu actually went up 21%. And it's impacted significantly more Americans. So it, it, you kind of do a parallel of the coronavirus and the swine flu and, and look at it and say, this just doesn't make a lot of sense. And part of it may be due to social media and the ability of news to be able to travel so much faster. Also, we're much more of a global community, so diseases will be passed on. Uh, the MERS virus, not a large number of people got it, but it was very, uh, uh, very deadly. It was primarily just in the Middle East. Ebola and the Zika virus that originated from Brazil. And here's the Wuhan uh, coronavirus.
Okay, now I'd like to talk, um, actually, I'm going to go back to this. Um, some other, other points. Um, I talked a little bit about a vaccine, and that's really going to be the ideal situation. And vaccines take about a year to uh, get from product or uh, testing to a drug can be produced. It just, it's like making wine. There's, there's certain steps that you have to go through before the vaccine can be prepared. Now, there's some information I've seen on China that they say they're going to have a vaccine for this in six months. And their pro medical protocols are going to be probably a little more aggressive than ours. So if a few people die to get a medicine in the market, they're, they're not going to be as sensitive as we would be. And, but they may get a virus in six, in six months. Um, a, a good, somebody I know and love dearly is my youngest brother, who's a PhD doctor in biotechnology from Stanford, and he runs a plant in Austin. And one of his employees is an R&D director of virologist, and, and they basically can confirm it would be uh, about a year before we have um, a treatment. Now, why that sounds somewhat dire and, and somewhat scary, it's going to take a year. I don't think it's going to be that bad, and this is why. What I want to share with you now is uh, an article that was in The Economist, and um, Guys, I'm, I'm multitasking. I'm not great. I can do one thing at a time. Anyway, so this is an article about the coronavirus, and we're hoping to be able to publish this on our website. Uh, we're currently working with our compliance department where we can, and I've highlighted uh, some of the, uh, the key points of the article. And here they talk about the, the, the former uh, SARS virus, COVID-2, and how they were able to use some of the activity. There's a bunch of papers being published. And if you go to these other pages, they talk in, for, the, for the doctors and the scientists on the call. Um, you will appreciate this article more than those of us that are not, but it talks about the dynamics of how you attack and kill it. But this, is the, this part of the, of the article, I think, is the most relevant. And you, you guys have heard about the drug uh, chloroquine with erythromycin as an effective treatment. And, and chloroquine or quinine was used against malaria. It's been around for decades. The other drug that's been mentioned in the press is a drug called Rendesivir, and it says experimental here, but both of these have shown some promise in treating the coronavirus. Now, this table down here lists some of the other medications, and I'm not a medical person, so I'm not going to try to pronounce all of these, but the important point to realize is a lot of these drugs are very commonplace and readily available. Now, if millions of people need them, there's going to be runs, but... The important part is the medical protocols of having something injected into your body where it doesn't kill you or hurt you has already been performed. What the medical community has to go through right now is this drug interacting with this virus, what happens? Does it cause something adverse? So, but the fact that they've already passed these drugs and they can be used in human beings or other ailments, that is a huge head start. And the reason this is so important we're going to have a lot of people in hospital beds around the country and probably in the more densely populated areas. If we can get people well quicker, they can turn the beds and get other people in there. That's going to increase the likelihood of survival. Plus, it will buy us time to get a vaccine so we can actually treat, uh, treat the, uh, the cause. If I can get this uh, available on the website, we'll, we'll, we'll put it up there. The other thing I'll add about this before I move on to the next topic is our, our government and the private sector and business has really come together nicely. Um, I know uh, 3M and Honeywell have really ramped up their production of the N95 mask. I think they're going to be producing like 35, I think 35 million a month. Um, and they're working around the clock and until this virus passes, you know, it's highly recommended that you should wear a mask. Uh, some people have said not to, um, but if you do wear a mask that minimizes exposure to the coronavirus, you know, it's not airtight around your mouth, but if you do get some exposure, it's minimized versus having nothing there. 
a couple other hygiene points I, I want to bring up while we're on the subject that, you, that I've not heard in the media. Um, actually, my brother was telling me about this, is that when you go out in public to the grocery store or to the pharmacy, um, don't talk to anybody. Why? Because your mouth's open. Breathe through your nose. Uh, if you don't have a mask, and my brother just had a baby, and he went to the grocery store yesterday, and him, you know, understanding how this virus works, um, he didn't have a mask. We put on a bandana, put some tequila on it, on wipes, and wore a baseball cap and sunglasses. Now, you talk about a, a picture that would create social distancing. He had no problem with people staying six feet away from him. So that's something you could possibly do if you need to go out and be in public. And those of you who may have a, a compromised immune system uh, or some other kind of ailment where it may make you more susceptible uh, to, to catching this horrible virus. All right. Um, okay, the next thing I, I, we want to talk a little bit about is what may happen, and we're going to talk about the, the oil market here because uh, we, we are bullish on the oil sector long term. It has taken a big hit down, but we think it, it will recover. We'll talk about that here in just a second. Here's some uh, U.S. economic leading indicators. And this organization, ITR uh, Economics, is a company I've, I've followed for years. I have their newsletter. They are based out of Canada, and they do a very good job of predicting business cycles. And this is from a presentation they did a week ago. And these are the trends of various economic activities as of a week ago. So granted, these numbers are going to change. They are going to be going down. But the reason I'm sharing this with you is our economy a month ago was incredibly strong. So it's kind of like if you're very healthy, you've been training for like a marathon or some athletic event, then you get sick, you're going to recover much quicker than, say, you were uh, you know, sitting on the couch, had a few too many pounds, um, you know, drank too much. You're going to have a much worse time overcoming an illness. So our economy was in really, really good shape. And I think because of that, we're going to be able to recover much quicker. And if you look here at savings rates and as a percentage of disposable income, um, if you look here before the housing recession and the, uh, the Great Recession here, we had negative savings rates, which means people were taking on debt and living way beyond their means. The housing crisis caused people to start to save money, and you start to see this uptick here, and it's projected that people's savings rates will, will increase. Um, and then retail sales is up here, and yeah, we're going to take a dive down uh, this year, obviously. And uh, ITR economics were predicting a recession, a mild one in 22 and 23, when I saw them speak about five weeks ago. And I think, obviously, this is before the coronavirus. But again, this is another chart that shows we were not in horrible shape when all this started. And that's going to give us the ability to bounce back quicker. Um, and retail sales, again, this is a similar chart. Um, I won't spend time going through the, this is monthly, 1 over 12, and then 12 over 12. But you know, here the stock market's here in blue. And you can see the drop that we've had since mid-February. But retail sales have held up. This will go down. But a lot of the, the retail sales that we have now are done online. Um, people may say, you know, what would be a good stock to buy now? You know, you know Mike, you may want to comment. But um, we, we find that a stock like Amazon may have some really good numbers because of all of the goods that are being purchased through Amazon because either your grocery store is out of something you want or you just don't want to venture out and be expo expose yourself to the potential virus. Yeah, Mitch, I can I can just add to that. Hello, everybody. This is Mike Lanise. Um, Mitch and I had this conversation just recently about Boeing and Boeing's fall from grace. Boeing was at 440 not long ago, and it's at 97 dollars right now. Part of Boeing's problems, I'm sure you guys have all heard in the news with their Max jet, but then they were also victim, just like all other stocks, when when the tide goes out, all boats sink. But when this, when this stuff turns around and comes back, all boats are supposed to rise. I don't think things like Boeing, even though cheap right now from its historic valuations, I don't think people are ready to jump back into something that is possibly having a cash crunch and might pull their dividend 
and also be sued. So I think Boeing's going to have a long road back, whereas Amazon, who has been known to blow out their earnings estimates, I think they are going to have a killer quarter. I think Walmart is going to do the same. Walmart has just been skyrocketing lately. Um, I think we got out of our Walmart shares back around the 210 level, and uh, and Walmart's just uh, – they came back down to earth a little bit. They were about the 125 yesterday. So, anyway, um, I, I just think what Mitch is saying is true. Retail sales, people still need products. They're finding different ways to get them, though. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Uh, you know, something that was interesting, uh, Nikki Haley was on the board of directors of Boeing, and she resigned today. And I think that's somewhat interesting because if Boeing gets a bailout from the government, and they may or may not, um, a lot of people have targeted her to be the 2024 Republican candidate. So maybe she's trying to clean up her resume and her act so she doesn't have uh, too many targets. So I, that, that's just my personal opinion about what happened today. Uh, but Boeing is, uh, has not done some things very well. Um, now we'd like to kind of talk a little bit more about the oil market and what may happen. And what happened, what's happened here is the United States has been the largest producer of oil, um, uh, re, or it's become the largest producer of oil. And this chart here basically shows the amount of production by country. So here's the United States, here's OPEC. The OPEC is multiple countries, and then here's Russia. And you can look at the consumption here and then the growth since 2016. So this is as of the end of the year. And we're showing this to you just, just to give you an idea of what the consumption was before all this started. China's, uh, China's uh, uh, demand for oil dropped by 3 million barrels a day when this coronavirus started. And I don't know what it is now. We'll probably get numbers in, in a few weeks. Uh, but the oil production will come back. So I want to go up here and talk a little bit about, Mike, you can jump in at any time. Um, uh, the Saudis and the Russians have gotten into a spat. And the key issue to know here is, even though Saudi Arabia can produce a barrel of oil for under $10 a barrel, their break even is around $25 a barrel. Uh, and when I say break even, that is because about a quarter of their population does not work. They're living on the dole. And the Saudi government basically pays these people and they're happy. If they start not getting paid, they're going to overthrow their government. They're going to have problems. Russia needs oil around $50 a barrel. And Michael, let you talk a little bit about that and the, the, the rubles impact. Okay, thanks, Mitch. So, so basically, the Russian government pays its people in rubles. Rubles are worth nothing in the open market. They're just a worthless currency. So Russia basically can produce oil for zero dollars a barrel. The problem is they sell 80% of, of their GDP comes from selling this oil on the open markets. The other 20%, I believe, comes from the sale of weapons. So if they start going underneath $50 a barrel, they can sustain that for possibly up to three years. They've built up their war chest to do so. But in the end, they need those petrodollars to go out in the open market and do what they're going to do. So it's not an internal problem. It's an external problem for them. And they are just tired of every time OPEC plus Russia makes an output cut, our shale producers continue to increase production. And I think our shale producers are around a $52 a barrel production. But as this whole thing has happened, Russia, OPEC said we're making cuts. Russia said no. And the reason Russia said no is because they're trying to bankrupt our shale producers. Well, OPEC took that as a slap in the face. Really, Saudi Arabia, they had this young, brash new king over there who just said, okay, heck with it. I'm just going to flood the market with oil. Well, apparently Russia is having some high-level talks because they were not expecting that reaction. At some point, the adults are going to come back to the table and negotiate these output cuts, especially since Trump came out this week and said, 
Oil is now critical, a critical part of our in infrastructure. As you're looking at bailing out things like airlines, he's including our shale producers on that list. So that alone took oil from touching down on $20 a barrel today up to uh, this week up to 25 a barrel. That's a 25% increase in oil. That's the largest increase. This happened yesterday. That's the largest one-day increase in oil prices ever. So I think we are going to find some stability down here. I just don't know how long it's going to last before we really find these support levels. Um, before it was great when we weren't producing a lot of oil, we get cut rate oil prices. Now as the largest exporter in the world, this is definitely this definitely can hurt us. At the end of January, we saw prices dipping down around 50. But we increased some of our position sizes rather than decreased. And then this whole blow up happened. So I've heard it described as the nuclear bomb going off in the oil markets, and it's never been seen before. So you talk about a black swan event that was unpredictable. We're sitting in it. But that also means some of the best values on the street are in these oil companies. And I don't mean your mom and pop shale companies. I'm talking about your Royal Dutch Shell, BP, Exxon Mobil, Chevron, your big boys. Those are what we are in right now. And they will have the cash to sustain them through these these times. And their dividends are great and presents, present the best values that we have right now on our balance sheet. Great, great. Mike, thank you. And what we, why we see supply being pinched by closures of various businesses, uh, but the demand while temporary on hold is present and will possibly cause a V-shaped recovery uh, once released. And once a solution is found to this coronavirus, either through treatments that get people healed quickly and a, and a vaccine, um, there's going to be significant upside market moves similar to what we've seen on the downside when people were panicked and selling. Now, the markets don't like unknowns. And unknowns are black and white. Either unknowns exist or they don't. You know, therefore, we're not worried about additional unknowns being uncovered that will cause additional panic. We are more worried about unknowns becoming knowns. And, the, uh, and once that happens, you're going to see a tremendous spike up in the market. And you can't be on the sidelines for this recovery. Now, we don't have very many annuities at all at Foreign Financial for you guys. All of your positions and portfolios are fully liquid. And if you need uh, some additional money, there is money available. There's no liqu liquidity crisis, as you may be hearing on the news. So now we'd like to talk a little bit about um, you know, what would, you should do. The first thing is just remain calm. This, this will pass. And some people Can say, I well, add? Add? Sure. I'm sorry. I just wanted to add, add one thing to that. Um, uh, hindsight is 2020, everyone. I would have loved to have gone a lot heavier into cash before all of these events happened. But now that they have happened, if we see a bounce in the market of 15, 20%, I don't know if that's a good time to get back in if we were sitting in cash. This market could drop 10% the next day. And this volatility because of that is so crazy that markets would have to go up 40, 50% and stay there for a little while before I would want to put people back in the market. And because of that, we can't get out of the market. We will miss that upturn. And that upturn will occur, especially if you're a long-term investor. No one right now is concerned about swine flu. So this is going to be the same thing in a number of months and years going forward. So it's just, it's just not a time for anybody to be getting out. This is the time for people to be getting into the market if you're not already there. Yeah, and, and I would just uh, tell, you, tell you guys on the call, a lot of you have invested additional money with cash, sa uh, cash savings because the market is, is low, and we know in the future it's going to be much higher than where it is. The chart I have on the screen, this is from our, our Bloomberg terminal, and it shows the P-E ratio, and it's down around 14.021 now. And you can just see this. It's almost like a straight drop in the last uh, 30 days. So it just shows the market is incredibly under undervalued. And I'll show another chart here in a minute that goes in that. A lot of people say, well, you should have been able to time the market. You should have been able to get out. 
no one can time the market. And this chart here, it, it, it's kind of humorous because, uh, you know, 49.9% of people say they can time the market are lying. And then there's 49.9% who really think they can. There's, you know, 0.01% who say they can do it, but we can't find them. If there was somebody that could do this consistently year in and year out, everyone would know about it. And some key statistics, and you guys can kind of read this on the screen. Um, JP Morgan, who's one of the institutions we use for information, he invested $10,000 in the S&P 500, and he stayed fully invested from basically uh, the beginning of 99 through uh, 2018. You'd have about $10,000. However, if you miss the 10 best days of the market each year, you'd only have half that amount. If you miss the 30 best days, you would have had uh, about a 38% loss or $6,200. And what, what has been shown year after year, or bear market after bear market, your best returns happen when the bear market ends and a new bull market starts. And if you try to time that and miss it, you're, you're not going to have returns and it's an irrevocable damage to your portfolio. Mitch, I believe the statistic that I saw was the largest market gains happen within two weeks of the largest market declines, something like 60 plus percent of the time. Great, great. And this is a, another slide I wanted to share with you. This is from Bespoke, another outfit that we use for information. And this just goes uh, goes over the last couple of days. It just shows the S&P moving day average spread. I mean, we're bouncing off of this bottom in an extremely oversold position. That's why the market is was kind of bouncing around uh, 20,000. It dropped down a little bit today. We're in the 19,000s. We don't know how much lower this market will go. But in terms of evaluation basis, if you're looking to deploy cash, you have money in bonds, now would be a great opportunity to deploy that to the market. And if you're scared about that, just dollar cost average in, put some money in uh, either on a weekly or monthly basis, um, then at least you can participate. All right. Hey, Mitch, um, just while, while you're paused there for a second, did you – um, I, I don't recall if you directed everybody to the upper right um, for the chat if they have questions. Um, thank you, Mike. I did not, but um, you want to go ahead and tell them. Okay, so so up in the upper right of everyone's screen, there's a little uh, bubble window like you'd see in a comic strip, and if you click on that, it opens up a chat window, and when we finish up this presentation, if you have questions, you can type them in here during this presentation, and then Mitch can go through and we can try to answer those. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Um, to kind of work, as we kind of wrap up, uh, here's some statistics uh, that you can see on the screen. Market rebounds for a duration of 11 to 26 months are slightly longer, and the rebounds are about 56.5% to about 85.5%. And the rebound is not a determining factor in the magnitude of the rise. A 56% half rise is 20 would be 20% above the December 19 high, and 85 and a half percent increase would be a 42% percent from the December high. The median is 60%. Um, and there's some statistics here at the bottom, and. 1931 investor who missed the 10 best days of each decade made 91 percent staying invested during the great depression all the turmoil we've had in, in our country's history their return would have been just under 15 thousand percent and then since you know the teens missing the 10 best days meant gaining only 95 percent versus 190 percent uh, until the decade of the odds but there was never a 10-year history of the market where you had a negative rate of return or a flat rate of return. So the odds of having a loss of over a 10-year period are only 4%. So, you know, the, the bottom line is having patient and discipline to stick with investment strategy is highly important to successfully manage any portfolio. 
if you have a long-term investment strategy, it's like, uh, you'll be far less likely to panic and be like the herd going over the, the cliff. And when we say long-term investors, we look at horizons based on your all's life expectancy and not when you retire um, be, because most people are going to be living quite a few years. And the problem we have in the markets, and we've had for quite some time, the bond market with record low interest rates means bonds have been extremely expensive and they don't produce much income. So unless you're a multi-multi-millionaire with a low risk tolerance, you can't have much of a standard of living on a bond only portfolio. Um, real estate is a liquid. It does have a place in the portfolio. Some of you may own real estate directly. Um, you know, limited partnerships, interest in companies. Some of you may have some of those, but not many. Those again are highly a liquid. You may get great rates of return. Uh, we rolled out a portfolio last fall that a number of you are in called the stock income portfolio that has held up much better through this downturn than some of the other uh, markets and portfolios. We've not written a lot of covered call income uh, for this past month because it's not ideal to write calls when the market is going down. We've written some. Um, once we start to see some kind of floor or plateau, we'll resume that activity. But that portfolio generates anywhere from uh, 10 to 15% a year of cash flow. And for those of you who are not in the portfolio, not heard about it, you have to have a million dollars in one account to qualify for the portfolio. And it's more conducive for people who are, um, if you're working in a, an IRA account or if you're retired, it doesn't matter because all of that income that would be generated is taxable income. So um, before this happened, our economy was incredibly strong in record levels of net worth, employment, income, and, and the stock market all-time highs. We're going to achieve these again. This, is, this crisis was not due to asset bubbles like the dot-com bear market or the housing crisis, which was uh, the Great Recession, and it takes a long time to get through recessions like that. This was medically driven. Even though we have this flu, quote unquote, we will recover stronger and better than before. We are the best prepared and most capable country to handle something like this, and uh, we will do well. Uh, one thing I hope happens is that we come together as a company, uh, country and people who have their political differences and maybe the, the media will become a little more kind um, because I think people are just tired of the arguments. We need to focus on solutions to help our fellow Americans. So, um, some things you guys can do with additional free time you have uh, at your houses is you can clean out closets, attics, um, garages, donate stuff you don't need to charities. Now, they're hurting right now too. I know Candace and I did that one night this week. You can play board games with your, uh, with your family. Um, it's something I did when I was a kid. And you can also go through scrapbooks. A lot of you may have pictures you've taken on trips. But you say, I'll get to that later. And, and a lot of people just don't have the time to do it. So those are some things you guys uh, can do. So that wraps up our, our first webinar. I appreciate your time. We appreciate your confidence. And now we'll open the floor to questions, and we'll go through a few of them here over the next few minutes. Again, if you guys do have questions, the upper right-hand corner of your window should have a little bubble box that you can click on and that opens up the chat and that's the live chat for everyone to see. You know, one question that we get asked quite often is when is this going to be uh, ending or when we get back to some kind of normal. No one knows. No one knows. Um, if we stay kind of hunkered down like we are, this the coronavirus does burn out over the next few weeks. We may be looking at June, July, or August, plus the warmer temperatures uh, will help reduce the virus's spread. And if these treatment protocols are approved by the FDA and the people who are sick get healthy, that's going to help as well. 
a lot of people are frustrated because a lot of the activities and hobbies we all have that we enjoy, we just can't do those. We have to find other things to, to keep us busy with our time. Mitch, would you like me to add anything about the stock income, what we're thinking there? No, it, it's all right. I've got some questions. Um, yeah, one of the, one of the, uh, one of you guys had, had talked about what is the safety of the banks with respect to uninsured amounts of savings. Um, I think the the government is going to open their checkbook and print as much money as they need to to make sure any large institution or in, in this instance any bank will not fail. And they've already done that in, uh, to a large magnitude in the repo market. Mike, if you want to talk a minute about that, about what the Federal Reserve did, I believe it was last week, and, and providing liquidity to the uh, repo market. Well, basically, the Federal Reserve is opening up its liquidity measures, and they, they called it, I think the term they used was a wartime liquidity um, type defensive measures. So anyway, in the short term market, um, the Fed allows people to, to borrow short term, when I say short term, less than 48 hours um, overnight to secure whatever transactions they're doing and provide liquidity for payroll, for anything else they're doing. Um, so that whole process that, that people were scared that we were running out of liquidity in this repo market uh, should not be a concern during any sort of downturn like we are seeing. And the moves by the Fed are just letting everybody know, hey, we got this. Don't you guys worry about it. Um, so they've taken some drastic steps. Uh, you haven't heard it discussed much in the media because I think it's a bit of a confusing topic, um, but it's really important for for um, both large and smaller businesses that, that use what they call that repo market. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Another question we had come in about how much cash should, should I keep on hand? And, um, and I don't know if this is uh, cash in terms of actual uh, C notes or uh, cash in banks. Um, I don't see the banks collapsing or having any issues. Um, I wouldn't keep an, an exorbitant amount of cash at your house, like over $10,000. Um, if your house has a fire, you know what happens to your cash. Um, in terms of uh, cash for your own needs, you know, minimum of say one to two years of uh, cash would be beneficial um, in, in a checking or, or savings account, and that would be for your your needs to live on day to day. Um, guys, that looks like uh, all we have today. Again, I appreciate uh, your faith and confidence. And uh, if you have any other questions, you can either email me or call me. We'll, we'll be around for a while, and obviously we're, we're working. Um, thanks again for your support. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Be safe. Thanks.